Hello, everybody. I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson. I'm a member of the project team for this data project that we're doing this semester. So I thought it might be a good way for us to start off by thinking about what are data. So just a little bit of background about myself. I was a classroom science teacher for middle school and early high school for a while. I went back and got my degree in fishery science and I was a fishery scientist for a while and then I morphed into a position where I was working as a translator between scientists and teachers in the field and and now I have morphed again and now I am a data educator so I spend my time researching and thinking about how can we learn from data and incorporate real world data into our teaching and into what we are doing so that we are all data literate to work in this data driven society. I have two little boys and a dog that does not always wear a birthday hat, um, but sort of outside of when I'm nerding out about data, which is what I'm excited to do with you all today. So I want you to pause the recording in just a few moments and respond to these three prompts. So you need a piece of paper. So the first thing I want you to do is list three words that quickly come to mind when you think of data. And the key here is quickly. We're just going for word association. Then I want you to write down two questions that quickly come to mind when you think of data, the word data. And then I want you to create a metaphor or a similarity, simile to describe data. So pause the video, write these these three things down quickly on a piece of paper. And when you're done, come back and we can continue with the video. Great, so data show up in a wide variety of ways in our lives, considering how, how much data there are, how much data are continuing to be developed and put out and collected on a minute by minute basis. At this point, we live in a data-driven world. And so this is often the way that data shows up in the news media, where we'll have a headline that tells what the takeaway is from the graph, we'll have a subtitle with a sort of more context for where the data were collected or what the sort of boundary of the data set is, and then a visualization, a graphic as the visual for the data. Data also show up in our daily lives everywhere. So, here in the top left, what I'm showing you is literally my electricity bill from New Jersey last May that we got and looked at and we're like, hmm, while the electricity company is charging us for a large amount of electricity use, this seems really outside the pattern. Um, the bottom is a picture of a Lego uh, configuration that my son put together. I recognize most five-year-olds don't make bar, bar charts or histograms with their Legos, but it's just fun. And I think part of it is like, when I was five, it would never dawn on me to make, you know, to make a graph, but he at five is already making graphs and looking at data in his daycare class. And then there's the obvious of, we have devices that are often collecting data on us at all times. And so we're constantly being presented with different kinds of data and different ways to visualize data. Data obviously have important components in our educational system as well. So data in math class, you know, when we work with data in math class, we're, obvious, we're often describing and comparing attributes or what we call variables in science. We are representing and interpreting the data, we're converting measurements, we're using probability to evaluate outcomes of different decisions, we're computing statistical analyses, if you've ever taken a statistic class. And the tried and true sort of four quadrant origin at zero, zero plot and on the graphing paper that many of us saw in math classes. But data has a really important role in science as well. And here I've highlighted the different components across all eight of the science and engineering practices in the next generation science standards that we've incorporated in, that we've adopted to be our science standards in New Jersey, as well as many other states across the country. And so while Sometimes we think about data as just analyzing and interpreting data. Data, in fact, plays a huge role in everything that we do when we're doing science. And we can see that in lesson plans where there's 
more and more lesson plans are on the market that incorporate real world data or have students collect their own data, just like you all are doing with your, with the, um, the information that you're collecting about the cloud cover and the temperatures and things like that. So there's a variety of different ways that we collect data and use data in science, but it's a, it's a key part of how we actually do science. And, you know, one of the things that's talked about a lot in science education as well as for as well as for students as we're learning science is this integration of these sort of core ideas of what we know about science to date what we've learned about the real world and the phenomenon what those these cross-cutting concepts across the different components of, of science, sort of regardless of what field, what are commonalities and sort of these things that we're thinking about it, the practices of what we do to do science, and data is really what we use to make this whole thing happen in the science. So that's a great kind of broad picture of why we need data and where data shows up. But let's think back to some really specific examples of what actually are data? If we were to define data, what would it be? And why is it different than just any number? And so the most basic definition of data, which is not necessarily the easiest one to interpret, is that data is a value that is stored in a location. So by value, I mean that there there is a number, there is text, there is an image, there are, there's a color pattern, like that is the value. That is sort of the, the nugget of, of information that represents something. Like we do in, when we use numbers, right? That number is representative of something. But the other key piece for data is that it's stored in a location, which is sort of a vague way. So let's, let's unpack that a bit. So that location can be an actual location in the real world. It can be map coordinates or GPS coordinates. Or there is a location to where that value, that number actually relates to in the real world but it also can be kind of a reference key and or variable, or as I said, attribute name as to where you can find that piece of information, that value to do something with it. So we can think about data. So that could be, for example, in a table or in a graph. There's, a, there's an actual location as to where that value sits in relation to other values. And it's these two pieces that there, that there is a value, a number, a text, an image, and that there's a location where that value exists is what makes it data. If that's kind of confusing, think about it like this. Data is the way that we take information and that it, we provide context to it so that we can analyze it and make meaning of it. Another key important thing about data is that when we use data in science or when we use data anywhere, it's important to remember that it is a sample of a whole population. So if we imagine that this box is the whole population of whatever we're, whatever we're studying, and by population, I don't necessarily just mean numbers of individuals within, number of living individuals within a group, I mean kind of any potential existence of whatever it is that we're studying. That's the population. So we have to think broadly for population. We can never have enough time or resources or money or attention span to actually go out and collect information on every single thing possible within that population. So instead what we do is we collect a sample and we collect values and you know values of those individual components of that sample. Which then begs the question of we have to make sure that we're thinking when looking at data is how representative is this sample of the whole population? What might be missing? What potentially have we oversampled? Different things like that. But that, that, that key fact that when we're looking at data, we're looking at a, a sample or a subset of the whole is key for understanding what we do with data. So I wanna spend a quick moment to sort of think about this difference between one versus many and exploring the difference between facts and data or numbers and data and how that relates to the kinds of questions that we ask of data, which is the next mini lecture that we'll dive into more deeply. So 
how tall is this boy? The answer is a number, right? There's an actual number. It's a simple fact that this boy is 180 centimeters tall, for example. But how tall is this group of children? Now we have data because we now have multiple different components, you know, multiple values, and those values have places in relation to one another. So right now, the, that place is just the sequential order from left to right on the screen, but we could imagine putting that into a data table. We could imagine plotting these values on a line plot, things like that. And with that, now that we have data, we have more than one value that we are looking at to answer our question, we get a more complicated answer, right? It's not as easy just to say, oh, 180 centimeters, because we have four different values that we now need to make sense of. And how do we talk about that? And how do we, how do we actually answer this question of how tall is this group of children based on these values from, from one another within these data? So another example is, which boy is taller? This can be a pretty easy question, right? We use numeracy. So if we imagine that the boy on the left is 180 centimeters and the boy on the right is 140 centimeters, we use some basic subtraction to figure out which boy is taller. But when we ask a question like, which group is taller? This is a more complicated question to answer because it uses data across two groups. So we're now comparing two groups rather than two individuals to determine to be able to answer this question. And inherent is this, is that there is variability or variation or differences, however you wanna think about it, within a group. So within the original group of just four children, when we were trying to assess how tall those children were, or when we are comparing two groups to determine which is taller, or are they similar, or are they different, or have they changed over time or space, there is inherently variation, variability, differences among each of those individual values, each of those individual fact points or values when we collect them together as a group of data. And working with that variability as we're working through data is an important component. It's important to note that sometimes groups can vary a lot, like a bag of Cape Cod potato chips, but sometimes they don't vary very much, like a box of Pringles, right? So how much the groups vary when you're just looking at within themselves or themselves compared to another variable is something that we need to account for and think about when we're working with data. So oftentimes a layer, a component of working with data and being able to articulate what the data are that we are working with comes down to the fact that we're thinking about, we need to acknowledge and describe that variability as part of trying to make sense of the data to answer our question. So another key thing about data to remember is that data have units. Data are from real life, so they will always have a unit, even if that unit is actually non-existent because it's a ratio and the units cancel each other out. But they had units going in, and so it's sort of this funky thing. Um, but data have units, and there's different kinds of units that our data can have. So we can use relative units, which is, as it sounds, relative to something that the user is familiar with, but that's not standardized across any user. So for example, I could use my arm span to figure out how long the, my kitchen is in terms of needing to go to Home Depot and then buy more tiles. But if my partner were to determine how long our kitchen is based off of his arm span, he would come up with a different answer because our arm length is not standardized. It's not consistent between the two of us. So um, another example of this is that my first grader is using paper clips to determine um, how long, how big his shoe is. But that's different, like it's a different number of paper, you know, different number of paper clips or things like that. Paper clips, while they seem standardized, are in fact not standardized. Um, standardized units are when we have a standardized way to measure so that everybody comes out with the same answer when using those standardized measures. So think a meter stick or an inch or a liter or 
many of those things that we often have been taught to include in our unit. Um, these examples are a fathom is how we measure depth in the ocean and it originally came out to be that six feet is the average arm span of the average male European and so that's how they set the fathom but they've standardized it to be one fathom is equal to six feet long. So there's the difference between relative and standardized units. So another key thing that we'll be focusing and talking a lot about this, this semester is that we visualize data to make sense of it. And what do we mean by visualized data or data visualizations? I just wanna take a, a few moments to make sure we're all on the same page when we're using those terms. So a visualization, just any visualization, is a process of making visual whatever you're communicating in terms of your specific knowledge. So we use visualizations all the time across a wide range of fields, not necessarily including data. An infographic, something that you may have heard of or probably have seen many of in your life, provide visual cues to communicate certain information. Now they can include data and they can include data visualizations, but they are a visual way to communicate information more readily. A data visualization or visualizing data is a visual way to represent that data or to see what's going on in the data. That's what we'll be focusing on and spending some time working with and building out and iterating over the next few months together, these data visualizations. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the recording again, get a new piece of paper or flip the paper that you had over, and what I want you to do first is list three words that come to mind when you think of data after watching this mini lecture. Write down two questions that you still have after watching this mini lecture or that were prompted by this mini lecture on what are data. And then finally, I want you to create one metaphor or simile as to what data are prompted by this mini lecture. So pause the video, keep these words up, Write down your responses to this three, two, one, and when you're ready, come back and start the, the mini lecture again. Great, so now that you have your initial response that we did at the beginning of the mini lecture and your new responses that you just completed, what I want you to do is pause and consider, look at both your initial responses of your three, two, one, and your new responses of the three words, two questions, and one metaphor. And what I want you to do is consider how do your new responses connect or shift from your initial responses to what you are thinking and how you think about data or what data mean or what data are to you. So again, pause the video, take a few moments and reflect on what's this bridge? How do, how does your, how do your initial connect or shift to your new responses? And then once you're done, come back and start the video again. Great, so thanks for taking the time to work through this mini lecture on what are data. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am part of the team for this project through the year. And so reach out to me if you have any questions, you can use my email or you can call and leave a message on my, on my phone and I will return a message back to you. But feel free to use me as a resource as we're going forward through this project. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed learning or thinking a little bit more or sort of refreshing your brain a little bit about what data actually are. Now we're gonna dive into how do we ask questions from our data and how do we explore our data to make more meaning of it. Thanks.